This conference will now be recorded. Um, greetings, um, everyone. Um, welcome to Africa Evidence um, webinar. This is our third webinar. We are so excited to be hosting um, this webinar. Just to say that um, the focus of this webinar is on evidence ecosystem maps and then looking ahead to 2019 for the AEN because we're really excited to share our plans with you um, as our members, partners, and people interested in the work that is done by AEN. Just to begin um, our program, I'm going to um, take you through what the program looks like, and then we'll begin then to start with the first presenter and the second presenter, and also we'll have an opportunity for questions, comments, and inputs from um, the people that are attending this uh, webinar. Um, just to indicate that my name is Sizi Weng Mwabe. I'm the Senior Manager for Africa Evidence Network. I'll be chairing the session um, today. And then I have my colleague, uh, Ms. Safir Rafat, who is the researcher at ACE. Um, he's one of the speakers that's going to um, share some of the um, insights about the evidence ecosystem maps. And also myself, I'm going to share um, what we're looking forward to in 2019 for AEM. Just to also indicate that um, the objective of this webinar is to um, use AEM as a key mechanism to support evidence communities and evidence use across Africa. And then secondly, we want to create a platform for sharing practical experiences of doing evidence in Africa. And then also the goals of this uh, webinar is to support um, the framing of evidence networks as the key mechanism and ingredient for a healthy evidence ecosystem in Africa. And then also we want to start a discussion um, format with other evidence using uh, this webinar series as a tool to make sure that we engage other um, networks. And also what we want to contribute um, with these webinars, we want to make sure that this platform is to discuss um, knowledge and to share to its peer networks of, of individuals and organizations. And then secondly, we want to build um, relationships and join up the, contin the continental evidence ecosystem. And then lastly, we want to identify um, synergies and emerging lessons learned in terms of the work that we do um, as AEM. And also just to introduce you to the, the program itself. So as I've introduced now the session, we will have our first speaker um, who's going to present on ecosystem maps, which is um, because we did um, a set of maps in 2016, and then we, done a, we did again in 2018. So all these um, maps are developed in, in line with our conference that we hold um, biannually. So let me introduce to you um, our speaker, uh, Mr. Zafir Rafat, who is a researcher at ACE, to share um, his knowledge and insight around um, the maps. Over to you. Hi everyone, um, and thank you for the for the warm welcome, uh, Siziwe. Um, and thank you all for joining at the third webinar from the AEN. Uh, my name is Zafir Ravid and I work as, as a researcher at the Africa Center for Evidence, uh, which is based at the university. We specialize in different forms of evidence synthesis in capacity support to decision makers and government um, in order to encourage the use of evidence. And we are the secretariat of the, the AEN itself. Um, and today I'll be presenting just how Sisiwe mentioned um, on a very unique data set that to our knowledge is the first of its kind, which emanates from hosting the conferences 2016 and 2018, um, where purses were, were, through a bursary program at least, purses were asked um, to map the evidence landscape within their respective countries or sectors. Um, and I will explain in a bit what landscape mapping itself involves. Yes, um, let me begin then. So, this, this is just a more or less image of how many people perceive EIDM to be, you know, strictly 
supply and demand dichotomy that needs to be bridged. However, within our experience of more than 10 years of providing EIDM capacity support uh, to government, we have learned that this is a largely a false dichotomy. Um, and as you can see with the people there, like people operate in various different levels. And a good example is many governments, um, they generate evidence, commission and conduct research. And also another important thing is that suggesting that there are only two sides to the landscape is false. As generally, um, I'm sure many, many of the audience even has personal experience with it, there are many actors in the middle of the landscape and overall. <clears throat> Sorry, is there some... I'm sorry, um, I believe there were some technical um, stories with the images. Can everyone see the, the slide? Yes, okay, great. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so just continuing where I stopped. <laughs> um, evidence in various forms, whether primary evidence mapping or even synthesis products generally need to be perceived as useful in order for many decision makers um, to, to, to actually use it is therefore important to understand how engagement occurs that facilitates research uptake, who the actors are, and to drive this, these sort of processes. And that's where and that's where evidence mapping comes in. Sorry, that's where sorry, that's where landscape mapping comes in. Um, landscape mapping is a research methodology that attempts to capture this complexity in role players and engagement within the evidence ecosystem. It's, a very nice way to actually understand what's going on in different countries and understand like what sort of networks are, are important for countries and specifically to certain sectors. Um, it maps key role players in the production of research. A good example is universities, research councils, think tanks, um, role players in the use of research as well. Um, governments, NGOs, professional bodies, as well as intermediaries, knowledge brokers, donor organizations and networks. In addition, landscape maps attempt to represent the relationship and evidence flow between these actors by using arrows and other descriptive graphics, um, which I will show you in the next slide. Um, and why is evidence in decision making mapping important? Well, we personally are interested in this in this map because understanding the landscape or ecosystem can be very important in strengthening the EIDM drive and ensuring long longevity and sustainability. <clears throat> so this is just a more or less overview of the template that we provided versus to illustrate what we wanted them to do. Um, in, an, in, in addition to, to this sort of illustration, we asked, um, we asked the applicants to provide us the main role players, their interaction, gaps in the landscape and the potential for upscale um, in a short write-up. The circles, as you can see, the orange and red circles represent um, initiatives that engage in cap capacity support and where there are networks and communities of practice to support the IDM. Um, all this information is contained in a user guide on how to commission landscape maps that is available on the African Evidence Network website. The maps themselves to uh, open access. <clears throat> So yeah, this all begs the great question, um, what did we find? And thanks to a very like a large amount of high quality responses, uh, we found a, a, a diverse array of ecosystem maps from various different countries that are so well detailed that give us such good insights in, in the little dynamics involved within countries. Um, I'll be presenting the, the, the results in a descriptive manner, looking at the 2016 and 18 surveys separately as well as comparing how they've progressed and looking at the combined overview. <clears throat> so yeah, these are the maps of 2016, the first batch, uh, there are 25 of them in total. Um, and yeah, we've, so we were, they are quite caps, but we do have quite a bit of information on West Africa, East Africa and Southern Africa, which is nice. And in 2018, we've managed to fill some of the gaps as well as strengthen some of the, the current, current countries that we did have. Um, and to provide a more a better description, so this is more or less. So we've managed to, 
beautiful in parts of parts of North Africa. Um, however, there is quite a bit of a gap that side. And although we do have the, 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 the gaps, it is certainly a very unique data set and the first of its kind. Both in terms of its comprehensiveness and concepts, and, and overall, it consists maps from 15 different African countries, as well as two maps that span more than one country. Um, and as you can see, if by comparing the maps of 2016 and 2018, there are certain gaps that have that we have managed to significantly um, better understand. And more importantly, even certain countries, as you can see. Um, especially around West, Eastern, Southern Africa. I don't know how else to, to explain it, but the green circles more or less, they indicate that certain areas we do have, we have strengthened our knowledge base on, on these specific countries. And I can see like a good example is Uganda, which is the darkest country there. We have nine maps from there explaining their ecosystem. Um, Ethiopia, Malawi, South Africa, those are all countries that we have a very, very good knowledge base on. Next, I will be moving to the ecosystem sectors. Um, so these are the sectors that we, we have in 2016. Um, Cross-cutting was, was quite a large contributor there, and then health. And then this is at 2018, and this is lastly the combined list between 2018 and 2016. And it's very interesting because um, it does indicate that we have a very combined, uh, we have a very diverse ecosystem that take for the evidence ecosystem specifically and looks at various sectors um, from our total of 40 maps from 15 countries. The most prominent sectors were health, um, second were cross-cutting, so organizations that look at various different sectors and to a limited extent um, in, in, in environment, the environment. Um, in summary, so just over a third of the maps did not focus on interaction in the EIDM landscape of a particular sector, but were cross-cutting sectors, um, speaking more broadly to the landscape in a particular country. This is very, very interesting as it reflects how dynamic the evidence ecosystem in, South Africa, in, in Africa is. Um, and approximately, so health is quite dominant um, in evidence use and approximately 40% of the maps were focused specifically on the health sector. <clears throat> Next, um, to go a bit more in depth with the ana analysis, we looked at the key role players in the, in the ecosystem. Um, and one of the standouts, especially on the supply side, is the importance of universities to produce relevant knowledge. Um, it is very important and capacitated local universities are key to a health there is variation across countries in the extent which universities are also intermediaries and engage in knowledge translation. Um, another very interesting aspect we gathered is the strong packet pattern on the supply side uh, with regards to m and &E providers. Um, they have played a very, very big role in a lot of the, the maps. And arguably the m and &E sector has developed a dynamic set, set of local institutions, which is very important, um, both in terms of acquiring funding, as well as just ensuring evidence use. Um, <clears throat> then with regards to the demand side, we have center of government and civil service training institutions. Um, center of government of departments do play a very, very big role in coordinating the EIDM space as well as national ecosystems and supporting a healthy demand for evidence. Um, and we find similarly that with regards to the demand, civil service training institutes are, play a very, very strong role. And it was a st strong theme generally um, with regards to how they can support government departments and units by equipping government delegates and colleagues with relevant skills in EIDM. Um, there were further strong themes for intermediaries um, with regards to the role of communities of practice and networks. These seem key to ensure healthy flow, a healthy flow of evidence between demand and supply. The no notable professional bodies mentioned by country were Tunisian Evaluation Network, Ugandan Evaluation Association, and in Kenya, the Evaluation Society. These play a key role in supporting not just the production of and uh, the production of, as well as the use of evidence. Um, and on a more regional level, um, we have the AEN and uh, the African Evaluation Association, which has played a very, very big role. 
And yeah, with, as you can see, we have the last two rows that have the same NGOs and international funders cross-cutting across supply, demand, and intermediaries. And this is interesting. For NGOs, they were mentioned across ecosystems, are playing a role in general with regards to locally re relevant evidence, advocacy for its use, and building bridges. Um, this highlights the importance, the important role that civil society as well as citizen engagements in evidence-informed decision making. But with regards to international funders, their importance again is emphasized throughout. They play a very, very big role in our ecosystem um, and our data set indicated them as contributing, as a large contributor on a whole with regards to evidence ecosystems. Next, uh, we will be looking so at the gaps in the evidence ecosystems and they were largely three themes, there's three strong themes that we, we, we were able to gather, such as interaction between role players, access to information infrastructure, and capacity and context. Um, with regards to interaction between um, role players, I'm sure I'm sure this is not the first time many of, 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 of the audience is, is, is hearing about the problem of poor packaging and de dissemination of research findings by research producers. And this generally reduces the probability of evidence reaching, re reaching the appropriate target group invo involved in decision making. And these are common discussions that we uh, that I've had a few times with regards to, you know, certain jargon, um, the way certain papers are structured. So yeah, it does play a very very big role. Um, another thing, another interesting gap was understanding each other's roles. Um, researchers often don't know the best entry point um, into a policymaker's world. And that does make it tricky. So understanding a researcher's role and how they can enter and how they can make an influence is very important. Um, and then this just like, again, just leads to the next aspect of a lack of established relationships um, between, and this is both inter and intra research and policy makers. Um, but however, we do recognize that there are improvements as the growth of networks such as APREA as well as the ARIAN does show. And linked to this, lastly, is um, a possible reason for the low relationships or low, uh, low established relationships is that there is an overall dedicated, a lack of dedicated platforms for interactions and relationship buildings. Um, with regards to access to information, that, that is pretty self-explanatory. There is quite a bit of access restrictions. A lot of evidence remains be, remain behind paywalls or with organizations, um, and this lack of sharing does make it a bit tricky. Uh, with regard to quality of evidence across all types of evidence, there's a lack of shared standards and methodologies, guidance, um, and lastly, infrastructure, of course. Um, this is a major hindrance I've actually experienced just recently, you know. Um, we, had to hope, we had to open up a very large data set, and like, issues like CPI and as well as internet speed do play a, a very, very significant role in how easy, easily and how quick it is to actually use evidence. Um, yeah, and this is a similar finding within our own maps. And lastly, we have capacity and context. So yeah, these again, so skills in EIDM. So again, like I've, I've mentioned with regards to interaction, it's, it's similar but different making research easily understandable as well as being able to communicate it effectively with policymakers is a skill and is an important skill within the IDM. And a lot of the times it is overlooked because we, we have people with a lot of expertise that tend to say, oh no, they should be understanding this or this is how something should, should go. That's why strongest, strongest skills, especially in certain, uh, in certain sectors are required. And we see this with certain sectors having concentrated strong skills, um, especially in healthcare. Um, a lack of enabling in uh, environments is another issue. And um, this actually we've, we've noticed is common is decision makers often do not work in environments that facilitate EIDM. And that, that does make evidence use a bit more challenging. And lastly, funding was a very, very common finding. Um, and it is, like, it is important to flag that it often related to the coordination of the funding and not necessarily the availability. <clears throat> so yeah, this is the part that I'm a bit more excited about. It's the pockets of excellence within the system. 
And it's great to see that there's so many aspects. We, we've managed to, 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 to only list a few due to space and time, but there are so many aspects that we can, that we can be so positive about. Um, one of it is system coordination. And this center of governments, uh, or center of government institutions for that matter, are key. We found that they play a very, very good role in matching demand and supply. So they ensure that producers of research and the supply of research is, is always, the producers and the people requiring research are always communicating. And um, as well as they coordinate capacity and support, capacity support and needs. We at the Africa Center of Evidence have had similar experiences where, um, where center of governments have realized that certain departments could use certain capacity support. And from that point, um, it was, yeah, it was coordinated. And yeah, with regards to capacity support, scaling up capacity support initiatives within government, this is even another very, very dominant finding that we do find that capacity support within government does work. And it's something that we really need to try and emphasize on uh, and, and plan on more further. And lastly, engage, engagement platforms such as networks and communities of practices we see with our, our own AN as well as Afreya and how people are able to communicate and how policymakers and researchers now are, are be able to communicate on the same platform. Um, and again, knowledge translation platforms, evaluation capacity, momentum in conducting evaluations as well as the relationship between some evaluations and bodies. Um, example of programs of PQ programs. <clears throat> and lastly, in conclusion, so we set out with this really, really great idea and reflecting on three years of mapping national evidence ecosystems, um, it brings us to a point where are we? The objective initially, you know, was to better understand the evidence and knowledge systems at, at a country and sector level in Africa. And through this and through the help of other partners as well, and as well to all the, the, the responders for the bursary who gave us very, very high quality work. We were able to commission and acquire 40 high quality maps from 15 different countries. Um, the presentation of the maps were, were done in 2016 and 2018, and we're, busy, we're currently busy with the synthesis of maps, and these are just the preliminary findings, but there's already so much that we have learned and we can learn from it. Um, and with regards to what ecosystem maps can contribute, a better understanding of the systems connecting evidence users and producers. And that is very, like we found a, a lot of the times there's these little silos that are built in um, with regards to where users reside and where producers um, reside as well. And that little engagement is something that like this, at least the methodology itself of landscape mapping does help fill. Um, as well as emerging insights into repeating patterns and characteristics across, across systems. So it's nice to know if certain challenges are in certain countries and how we can learn from those challenges to apply in our own different contexts. And lastly, a platform to think about connecting systems within and between countries. And this might help to have a sort of, this is very blue skies thinking, but a sort of, you know, common understanding of the overall evidence landscape between our countries and how we, can communicate with, with each other, just an open channel, you know? So if you know that there is some issues, let's just say in the environmental sector, and you know, this is a similar issue in another country, you know, we have these sort of platforms and we know who to engage with. And this this is very, very interesting. And lastly, my final remark from, um, for, for, actually for all of us engaging with the maps is that the Africa evidence ecosystem is vibrant, it's dynamic, and in many regards, it's leading innovation in the global EIDM community. Um, it's so interesting to see how, you know, so many of our organizations need to be so dynamic and so cross-cutting and understand so many different systems with around it. That, and it's also really nice to see so many of our organizations excelling at that specific environment. You know, we have so many innovative um, organizations as well as the government departments, such as the TPME in South Africa, the Office of the Prime Minister, MNE in Uganda, the Ministry of Scientific Research and Innovation in Tunisia, um, yeah, then as well as the government, government ministry responsible for coordinating the use of evidence across government and Ministry of Scientific Research and Innovation in Cameroon. And then we have really, really good rapid response work from um, the Makarere University, as well as the evidence mapping universe uh, at the mapping work, which is which resides quite a bit at the Africa Center of Evidence at UJ. 
and as well as the growth of networks such as the AN and the Thank you so much for listening. Um, yeah, these are my contact details. Thanks, I'm over to you, Cecilia. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Zafir, for a detailed um, presentation. And I hope, I'm sure there are questions, um, inputs from um, the audience. So we'll give an, five minutes for questions, comments, and inputs from um, the audience so that we can have some interaction um, between ourselves. Any inputs? Hello, can you hear me? Um, Keshav, I see you would like to um, give a comment. Can you please unmute yourself? Because I was trying to unmute you so that you can be able to um, comment. Can you unmute yourself and give your input? Yes. Can you hear me now? Hello? OK, so what I'm trying to um, find out, if you can hear me, is um, where the data from the different um, countries were taken from and uh, in particular I wish to know for Ghana where um, from which source the data was gathered. Um, catch up you are unable to we're unable to um, hear you from your side so we're just going to go through some of the chats and then allow Zafir to give some of the um, comments and inputs from his side with the questions that we are receiving from the chats. Okay. Hi, Yvonne. Um, thanks for the great question. And uh, so the question was, I have a number of maps you from the health sector and one could argue that there's long history of EIDM. Did I see any differences in the ecosystem and versus other sectors? And yes, actually, we did see quite a bit of, of differences, um, especially in terms of the strength of, of institutions as well as there's, there, there generally is a lot more detail on the ecosystem with regards to health, the health sector, and that could be largely attributed to the long history and organizations lasting for very long within the health sector. And yeah. And with regards to Kim, um, Kim Guyen, they are, role, they are key role players, but who should be a driver in the evidence ecosystem? My feeling is that this answer can't be, so it shouldn't just be policymakers, it shouldn't just be researchers. I think it should be everyone, intermediaries, producers, as well as, um, as, well as the users, because um, for, for, for evidence used generally to pick up traction, it has to be bought by everyone. You know, and we all can learn of each other. I'm sure there's enough that researchers can learn from um, from from policymakers in terms of how they prefer knowledge packaged, what sort of communication streams are passed, and likewise with regards to research as well. What like it's good for researchers to know what sort of research is required by governments, 
So I do feel that this would need a very multi-dimensional approach and that would ideally, so I think it's not a specific driver, but I think all in all it would be to have a multi-dimensional approach to it as the core driver. Um, thank you very much, uh, Zafir, for um, your input because we've received those uh, questions through the chat. Um, can we just um, go to the next item where then there'll be another opportunity for questions, answers and inputs um, to give the presentation on looking ahead to 2019. I think um, it's been one year I've been working for AEM. It's been an amazing journey to work um, with the team on different aspects of, of the AEM. Just to indicate that um, AEN is a community of more than 2,000 members right now. You see the growth because last year we had 1,063 members. So we've grown sort of doubled the numbers this year. So that means um, AEN is growing um, very well and it's supported by the Secretariat within the University of Johannesburg. And as AEN, we believe that only together can evidence informed decision making become a reality. That is why we ensure that we we'll try to work together with different partners, our members, because their contribution is critical and is important in how we do our work. And also, most importantly, our goal for 2019 is to ensure that AEM is strong, it's sustainable, it's well-governed, it's member-driven network that is grounded in the culture of experimentation and learning, because we want to make sure that we learn from our lessons as we do the work. And also, we want to make sure that we contribute to the strengthening of the evidence ecosystem in Africa in order to contribute to an increased use of evidence in decision making, because that is important for us to make sure that um, the evidence is used um, in decision making. Um, some of um, our achievements in 2018, um, or in the past 12 months, we secured funding from the Hewlett Foundation that has enabled the AEM to pilot some of the new initiatives and reflect on its activities. And, and this process has strengthened um, the organization in the past year. And we are excited to have been able to deliver our services to our members, including in particular, Evidence 2018, our conference, that also included the hybrid conference where we had members joining us digitally. We have also expanded our work in a number of exciting ways including we, we launched the Africa Evidence Leadership Award. We facilitated a series of activities on mechanisms for evidence use in Africa and as a relationship-based institution, because those are important to us. It has been challenging to maintain the strength of our initial network relationships as both membership and the secretariat has increased in size. So, um, it's not longer easier to now rely on personal relationships, so we need to make sure that we strengthen all those relationships across um, the network. So this shift does represent a huge potential for sustainability of the network, and we are seeking to understand what this expansion means for our ways of working, and so that we are able to adapt accordingly, because we want to be a network that adapts and is innovative and is flexible and also is able to respond to the needs of its members. Then the question is, where is AEN going? And with the funding now confirmed from for our secretariat in 2019, our team is well placed to reflect and evaluate the progress towards its goals, um, to refine the strategic plan and further prioritize our medium and long-term goals, strengthen and ensure our facilities are fit for purpose to cater for the increased number of members, including our membership database, our website, and our office equipment, and share knowledge and understand about what is happening in the ADM field, and advocate for evidence-informed decision-making in Africa, and for Africa's place as a leader within the global field. We also want to support capacity sharing. We want to bring people together to build those bridges between individuals and evidence communities across the traditional boundaries. Um, we are continuing to strengthen AEN 
and develop our strategic plan and ensure that our operations are effective, are efficient, are, you know, in, in, they're able to respond to the needs of our members. The Africa Leadership Award will continue to run and we will open our nominations in 2019. And please note, we are shifting from the process of application that we used in 2018 to a nomination uh, process. We are developing a linked series of webinars, blogs, to allow members to join discussions and deepen debates on key issues affecting our work. We will be consolidating learning from various conference sessions, workshops on capacity development hosted by AEN over the last two years. Because we'd like to document that and say, um, what are the findings there? How do we structure and strengthen our capacity sharing um, strand? This will be linked to a satellite session that is going to be conducted at the conference, AFRIA conference in March 2019, where we will launch the next phase of our dialogues on capacity development. We will be at AFRIA in March, as I've indicated earlier, and we will have an exhibition stand and various sessions in partnership with other organizations that we've worked with over the years to make sure that we um, are able to send our message across to the audience there. Please come and find us at AFRIA because we'll be there looking forward to meet some of our members who will be attending. We'll also be attending other events throughout the year, which is 2019. Please get in touch with us if you are running an event and you would like to work with the AEN. We are learning from evidence which was one of our biggest um, events that we've hosted um, ever and which has provided us the most diverse um, you know, um, attendees and delegates. Because we want to make sure that we use those learnings to ensure that um, in the next um, event, we're able to, to respond appropriately. And we're already planning for Evidence 2020, which is very exciting. We're looking forward to that and designing an interactive engagement and having events to build up to 2020, which is going to be our webinars, our blogs and other events over the next two years until um, Evidence 2020. We will be improving and upgrading our website, providing new and updated resources, and even more opportunities to engage um, with us and one another as members of the AEN. We'll continue to join, work and capture and showcase the great ADM work being undertaken across the continent. Please get in touch to share more of your work because we'd like to know um, what other people are doing and learn from them. We will be investing more and exploring how best to facilitate the use in Africa. Look out for the events and the discussions on this because we're going to have a calendar of events that will be uh, spread out through the two years building up to 2020. So it will be great for you to join us and participate in those events. We will be just diversifying how we engage with you as members. Look out for our annual survey in 2019, but also more frequently and more personal interactions with us as we seek to learn what you want from the network in 2019. So basically, I think that's where we want to take the AEN in 2019 to have more interactions with our members to respond more effectively and more efficiently to how we work with our members of the community. As the network is growing, 2,000 members are a lot. And I, I, I guess um, 2019, um, there'll be more members that will be joining the network. And um, that's exciting for us. We're really, really excited and looking forward to 2019. Thank you very much. This is an opportunity to ask questions and um, give inputs as um, members as well. Messi, I see your um, your mic is, is is not unmuted. Are you? Do you have an input or a comment? Please share. Mm. 
Hello. Hello. Hi, Janine. Sorry. Um, Hello. 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 In countries that speak different languages, and it will be really helpful as well if, if you know, um, if like if you are aware of anyone to 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 just sort of maybe highlight that what we are doing, and maybe provide us with some maps around those sort of countries it could be really useful. We do have a few a few maps from other countries that do speak different languages, so that is good, and it is growing. So this is a growing process. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. Eh? I think just to add on, on what Zafir has said, in Evidence 2018, we had a workshop on breaking the barriers between Anglophone and Francophone um, countries. So that is something that came out very strongly to say, how do we then uh, respond to um, delivering our services in Francophone um, countries? For example, um, for Africa 20, and 19, AN is going to be partnering with WASI and 3IE. So in our exhibition stand, there will be a French-speaking person and an English-speaking person. So we're going to try take, to take small steps as the AN to ensure that we cater for our Francophone uh, members, because we have a lot of members that are from the Francophone countries. So we want to be able to respond to them as well, so they can also benefit from the products that AEN um, is putting out. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Hi, Sizue. Hello, Sizue. Hello? Hello? Oh. Hello? 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 Um, I think we are experiencing some technical issues from getting um, audio from members because some of the members' um, microphones are on, but we're not hearing um, their inputs. So I will, will try again just to see. I see Philemon is on and Janine is also on. Um, we'll see who speaks first. Um, you can ask your question. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Hmm. Okay, I think that we've fixed the, the problem. So, Janine, your, the floor is yours. You can um, ask your question. Apologies for that technical glitch. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, I Hello. can hear you. Hello. Yes. 
Okay. Uh, the thanks, yeah, thanks, Isra and uh, Zafer. Um, I'm the one who asked the question from the francophone side uh, because probably I'm, I, 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 I'm a francophone at the same time I can speak English. So, um, as you know, evidence is emerging on the continent. And um, if we want to represent the continent, you know, correctly, I think we should put in measure some measures to to bring in our colleagues from you know French speaking countries and Luxophone, you know, Portuguese um, speaking countries, so that we can all benefit. I mean, we could all contribute and um, and and strengthen the 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 center and as well benefit the the outcome of uh, the research generated around the evidence base. So I wanted to find out if there's any uh, mechanism in place. I heard that you, you, you I mean, Zafer said that Gabon was involved uh, in your mapping. Uh, Gabon is a French-speaking country. Tunisia is a speaking country, a uh, French-speaking country. So what are the mechanisms in place you have to attract our fellow colleague? Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and we have like Cameroon as well, but yeah. So generally, we send it out to our whole network, um, and th that expands. I think there's how many countries just to, to check? Forty-two. Forty-two countries in Africa. So we do we we do send it out, and we we are open to um, to francophone um, applications. But it is something that we are aware of as a gap, you know. And I do think that it's very important to engage better with them and, and it's something that we are working on and hopefully for the evidence 2020 bursaries uh, or, or evidence map, mapping thing we, we will be able to to sort of engage a bit better but I, I do really really believe that it's it's something that like is very important um, on a whole for evidence use um, because much of like these little barriers is, is really something that I, I do feel that it's especially in today's day and age becomes a lot more easier to to, to address um, with, with technology like Google Translate or whatever it is that you use um, and just a broader network as well you know so for example yeah like it does help uh, but yeah we are we are make, taking initiatives and we do understand that this, this is a big problem and as you see we mentioned this is a strong theme within our own conference and we had a, a workshop on it as well um, with people from various different backgrounds or engaging and trying to understand what sort of challenges they are and how we can address that. And we will take that sort of information and um, better strategize in future. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Zafir. Just, just to also um, indicate, um, Janine, we also um, piloted our governance structures within the AEN. So we have the secretariat where we had a co-chair when we, we used to have just the chair. And then we appointed a co-chair in 2018 and then secondly we um, advertised for the reference group which has 16 members across the continent so we've tried with that group to make sure that we have people in different pockets of the continent representing um francophone countries anglophone countries so that group the reference group is the members voice those are the people that are going to help us to strategize in terms of how do we um respond to that to, to support um, these other um, communities that are within the network, but are not benefiting that much. And we have an advisory group as well. They also are supportive, helping us in terms of how do we um, lead the network and, and govern ourselves and make sure that we're able to, um, to respond to um, all communities across the continent. Thank you very much. Any other person who'd like to give a comment or a question? Can you hear me, Mrs. Iwe? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Great. So um, I tried asking a question earlier, and mine was in relation to the evidence gap maps, and uh, specifically where the, the data come from. And uh, my interest in particular is with Ghana, and uh, which particular institute or publication was contacted for the data. Thank you very much. Uh, Rafir, uh, Zafir will respond. Um, so thanks for the question. So um, we have various, various, like the, 
the Bosleys come from various different backgrounds is is represented by the center by, by the sectors but it's, it's literally just the bursary application that people apply for and um, all of them were really such good quality but overall so um, we have various institutions so like we have clear from South Africa like we have different institutions and if you want a comprehensive list um, it is online with regards to the individuals and the organizations they they come from Um, thank you very much, uh, Zafir. Is there any other person with a question? Yes. Can, can I ask a question? Hello? Please go ahead. Hello? Uh, yes, please. My question relates me? with the, I mean, with the, yeah, uh, my question is related with the findings. I mean, it, uh, have you produced a comprehensive report? On, uh, on what you have presented are, and are these reports are available online, maybe on the site? So not yet, actually, um, we're still working on, on our final report. This is just our preliminary thematic analysis. Um, and yeah, so we've presented it at a few conferences as well. It's been an interesting journey, especially learning about different ecosystems. Um, I think one of the benefits and and one of the benefits and challenges of this process is that there's just so much information, you know, um, which we are still busy synthesizing. And we've managed to synthesize with regards to the gaps. And yeah, hopefully we are working on, on a good report and a paper, which, which should be available soon. Um, thanks for your question. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else who has a question or a comment? Hello. Hello, please go ahead. Yes, um, thanks, Ziziwe. Uh, I wanted just to, thanks for the all the input that you've given regarding to the question I asked earlier on for the inclusivity of other uh, colleagues from the French speaking and, and um, the Portuguese one. So I, since you've explained about the structure, so I have just some, some suggestion. Uh, if you have the reference group and within the reference group, you say that you've got a representation of I can imagine from French speaking to English and to Portuguese. Um, then I think those people should be the one, they should know the, the environment very well and be able to, to work on existing network because we have regional network. I am from Rwanda, I'm based in South Africa and I'm part of the, the School of Public Health in, at the University, University of Rwanda. But we have, we have, a, we have regional structure at East African community, and we do have some structure that will include both francophone and, and anglophone. Um, so my suggestion will be to work on existing network because we have of some existing network on different um, uh, subjects. Uh, so if you want to maximize, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have to just work on what exists and try to spread out the word. And I'm sure there are quite a lot of people who will be interested to join the I mean, the network. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Janine. I think that's a very important uh, input that you've given us because what is in what uh, within the work that the AEN is doing, everything that we do is grounded in building relationships to avoid um, duplicating. So the members, yes, they are from um, different pockets of the continent. And next year we'll have a face-to-face -face meeting with all the members, so to strategize on what is the best way um, to approach um, the work that we want to do, and also analyze who are the existing networks that we can work with, we can, we can partner with. So I think that's something that we are going to do. We will not reinvent the world. Thank you very much. Anybody else who would like to who has a question still, or a comment, or an input? Hello. 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 Can Kim. you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, please. Um, um, you, you know, um, 
I'm not is uh, I don't have any experience um, about the mapping uh, of the evident uh, um, ecosystem mapping. But uh, what you saw me today is incredible. Um, so, but uh, you know, uh, okay. I'm from um, Center for Evidence-Based Healthcare at Stellenbosch University. Um, I'm just wondering if maybe uh, have, uh, do you consider of mapping uh, ev evidence ecosystem for healthcare? Because as I as um the uh, Zapier uh, uh, show in the slide earlier, it quite it quite the big uh, uh, proportion in terms of health. But I'm just wondering if you can uh, go or show more detail in terms of health. What actually uh, 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 we can see in there? What burdens or what group when? Uh, you know, uh, more vulnerable, what is the gaps uh, uh, for uh, uh, needs for research? Do you understand my questions? Yes, Kim, thank you so much, actually. Um, and I think I think that, that is a very, very good point. And given the large the large proportion of healthcare and like, like I do think that a good subgroup analysis will be able to happen um, sector specific. Uh, this is something like thanks for that. something that that I do think that so we have discussed before and something that we are gonna gonna go in a bit more depth um, and yeah so hopefully if we have enough um, yeah if we if if we have enough math but for healthcare we do uh, we will have a, a solid subgroup analysis and and likewise so I think I do think that there is that that it, it's it's difficult to avoid the different overlaps that there often is. You know, so although healthcare is one of the dominants, you know, it does have certain overlaps with other institutions and other cross-cutting institutions and that. So it will be very insightful in terms of subgroup analysis, but I do think that looking at, at the map holistically does provide even information in its own right that is very good in terms of understanding the sort of dynamics and even the skewness of expertise. I'm not yes, sure how yeah. you look at Thank you, yeah. I thought Thank in terms of uh, uh, because we we uh, we also see several mapping in terms of uh, 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 um, burdens of disease and the use of evidence in galas, but it's not very comprehensive like if evidence in the eco uh, system. So actually, yeah, if uh, uh, in the future you can go more in depth, that, then I see it's going to be very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Thank you so much. Yeah, that actually sounds great. Um, thank you very much. I think we have run out of time for this webinar. And um, from the AEN, um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who attended um, this particular webinar, which is our third one. Thank you very much for participating in the work that AEN is doing. We're really excited and looking forward to 2019. From us to you, um, happy Christmas and happy 2019. Um, thank you very much and goodbye. Yeah, I'm done.